Um, so I'm going to tell you today about some uh, work from my lab using laser ablation to probe uh, the mechanics of the mitotic spindle when cells divide. Um, and the, the broad question that my group is interested in um, at NC State in the physics department is, is how um, biomolecular properties at the, um, at, the, at the protein scale or at the, at the um, molecular scale give rise to higher order mechanics. How do these um, cellular scale or larger structures emerge from these um, molecular parts uh, that have uh, very interesting properties that we can understand on a, on a molecular scale like we just heard? How, how do they um, interact and have emergent properties on the um, cellular scale. And we're interested in trying to understand how does the architecture of the structures that emerge um, inform those structures and what might be design principles of those structures that might be true um, across different, many different kinds of cytoskeletal structures in the cell. And uh, one of the ways we think about this broad question is how biological structures can achieve this paradox of being both re robust and adaptable, right? There's always these trade-offs between um, needing to adapt to change shape um, in response to changing signals. For example, on the left here um, is an example of an epithelium that's been wounded and the cells somehow detect that change and adapt to it by moving in um, to close that wound. And on the right, is a movie of a developing Drosophila embryo, which of course has these very dramatic adaptations um, and, and changes in structure as, um, as the embryo develops that have to be balanced with robustness to always happen in the same way at the same time, right? So it seems like there's some tension there between these two uh, features that, that, um, the, that cellular shapes have to achieve. And of course, many of the, um, many of the, the processes that um, by which the cell achieves these kinds of things are underlied by, by cytoskeletal structures, right? Um, so many different structures within a cytoskeleton give cells um, their dynamic structure and organization. And we can often think of you know, sort of which um, cytoskeletal molecules are used for a particular structure as being tuned to um, the polymer that's used, right? So I'm gonna talk to you today primarily about microtubule-based structures, and we can think of microtubules as being kind of the long and, and straight um, elements of the cytoskeletal family. They have persistence links that are longer than the cell. Um, so over the length scale of the cell, they're pretty long and straight. But of course, um, as we heard earlier, um, intermediate filaments and also actin um, can, can adapt um, equally important and, and varied shapes. And so one of the ways cells can adapt is by sort of picking the right, um, the right polymer that the right mechanical properties for the for the job um, that it wants to achieve. Um, and another thing that we're going to touch on today is this um, really dramatic ability of all of these polymers, but we'll talk in particular about the microtubule cytoskeleton to change their shape over the course of a cell's a cell's life cycle, right? So in particular microtubules, um, I like to think of an analogy to a building. If you can imagine a building that could like take all of its I-beams, uh, take them apart when they were done being a building structure and reassemble into a, a suspension bridge. Then when it was done reassembling, being a suspension bridge, take itself back apart and turn itself into a building. Of course, at the macroscopic scale, this would be a gigantic phenomenal feat of engineering, right? That um, that the cell does, and you know, the cell cells parts that do this. Not only um, do they reuse parts in dramatically different organizations, they also manage to self-assemble, right? So we've got these very complex structures that that can build themselves inside a cell. When a cell goes from on the left being an interface cell, where we can think of the microtubules as being kind of the highway network of the cell, at least in part, and then on the right they build this. Um, mitotic spindle structure that's this uh, cellular-based machine for segregating chromosomes when cells divide. Um, okay, so we're in my group very interested in um, chromosome segregation, both from its uh, biophysical perspective as this uh, fascinating and amazing cellular machine, and also because it's very important for cell health, right? So missegregation in the germline can lead to birth defects and miscarriage in somatic cells is associated with cancer. And of course, during development, spindle size and orientation are also uh, very important. So this, this cellular machine has very important um, role, a, a very important role to play in human health. 
Um, but it's also just a very beautiful mechanical process, which I think has been apparent since like the very advent of cell biology. So on the left here, there's a, a drawing from um, very um, early microscopy of cells where even when you can't understand exactly how these chromosomes are lined up, it's clear that something very mechanical must be going on, right? This cell, the chromosomes, um, even from this, this uh, sketch of the cell, you can see they must be getting pushed and pulled into the middle of the cell somehow and then pulled into the two new daughter cells when cells divide. And of course, as video microscopy progressed, um, the mechanical nature of this process became even more apparent. Um, as you can watch here, somehow those chromosomes get lined up and then there's some signal that happens and they get pulled into those two new daughter cells um, by, by something that must be dragging them into this, this, these two, this new cell. Okay. And so of course, we now know a little bit more about the machine that's doing the pulling here, um, which is the mitotic spindle, which is indeed a machine made out of microtubules. Um, the, there's a few features of the spindle that, that you'll need to know to um, uh, be clear in the rest of the talk. The first is that the spindle is organized into a bipolar structure. So the microtubules are geometrically polarized. So we talk about a geometric plus and minus end of the microtubules. And in each half of the spindle, the microtubules tend to be oriented the same way, although there's an overlap region in the middle. Um, and these two poles are really important because they determine where the chromosomes are ultimately going to um, be delivered at the end of cell division. Um, and then a couple other uh, features of this structure that you'll need to know, be familiar with for the rest of the talk. The first is that um, the bundles of microtubules that actually attach to the chromosomes um, are called K fibers and that K stands for kinetochore. And the kinetochore is a smaller cellular machine that actually um, attaches the chromosomes to the microtubules and does the pulling by, by chewing, helping the microtubules chew back um, as the chromosomes segregate, okay? And this structure has one of the um, features that I've outlined, which is that it has to be both dynamic and robust. It gets assembled at the beginning of cell division and then deconstructed at the end of cell division. It has to change its shape as it um, progresses throughout the cell cycle. So, so this spindle structure has to undergo challenges of microtubule turnover. The um, microtubules within the spindle turn over on the time scale of seconds or minutes, whereas the, um, the uh, uh, the spindle as a whole persists for about an hour. So if we go back to our um, building analogy, we can now think about our building that not only can assemble itself, um, but also replace all of its constituent parts on a time scale much shorter than the lifetime of the building as a whole. Um, it's got to undergo uh, mechanical forces from inside and outside the spindle as, it, as the cell changes shape um, over the course of cell division. And then it also needs to dynamically remodel once the chromosomes are lined up. That part happens kind of as the spindle is being built. And then it needs to um, change its shape in, in order to actually segregate chromosomes. It elongates and, and moves the chromosomes into each half spindle. Um, and then eventually needs to take itself apart so that its constituent parts can be reused um, and interface uh, as the microtubules uh, organize into a different structure. And so um, while we now know, you know a lot about this structure that I've already told you has been studied for um, more than a century at this point, um, we, one of the things that we have kind of a, a clear list of at this point is like, what are the molecules involved in building this structure? But it is still um, quite a challenge to perturb the mechanics. So perturbing and controlling the mechanics inside the cell um, is a challenge because of course it's enclosed um, inside the cell. And so we, we can't push and prod directly. So we need tools to exert mechanical perturbations that are not um, prohibitively damaging to the cell. And so the primary tool my lab uses for this is called laser ablation. Um, and so the way this works is that we cut um, microtubules within uh, the spindle of a dividing cell, which then leads to these microtubules that are severed. And we can ask essentially what happens to the spindle structure when we destroy part of it, okay? And so I'm gonna tell you two brief uh, vignettes of, of uh, two different organisms with which we, uh, to which we've been applying this uh, approach in the lab. One is to the mammalian K-fiber bundle and the second is to the um, fission yeast mitotic spindle. Okay, so first in the mammalian system, um, I, I wanna briefly touch on previous work that I'm, that I'm um, not gonna show you today, but which I did as a, as a postdoc with Sophie Dumont, um, which is that we found that the initial response to laser ablation in the mammalian spindle is that um, 
the K fiber can actually detect and repair the damage that we've done. So when we cut the K fiber away from the spindle, um, some machinery that's dynein based, that's this purple molecule here, gets recruited to that microtubule minus end and pulled into um, back into the pole to repair that damage. And we also found that the K fibers within the spindle are anchored not only at the poles, as you might expect from my cartoon structure, but also along their length. And so both of these mechanisms are ways to help ensure robust chromosome segregation. But then as I was starting my own lab, I became increasingly interested in this question of what makes a K-fiber a K-fiber. So if we zoom in on this structure of the K-fiber, this microtubule bundle that attaches the chromosomes, um, while in the particular um, system that we study, which is uh, PTK, rat kangaroo, kidney epithelial cells, we know that most of the K-fiber microtubules extend all the way from the chromosome to the pole. We don't have a good sense of um, what's going on in between. So whether those microtubules are tied to each other along their links, whether they're mechanically connected to each other along their links, and if so, um, what biochemical um, contributors might be um, giving it that mechanical support. And so um, in some, I'm gonna tell you about some work from a graduate student in my lab, Mark Begley, who asked after we cut, what happens to that K fiber itself? So does it, um, when it's detached, does it hold together or does it splay apart? Um, so if it holds together, that would indicate that it's you know, sort of being attached along its length, not only at the chromosome and the pole, or is it, if it splays apart, it, that would indicate that it might not be. And again, these experiments are done in uh, rat kangaroo kidney epithelial cells, PTK2 cells, which are an ideal system for this because they have few chromosomes, uh, making it easier to perturb individual K fibers this way. And they also remain relatively flat when cells divide, making them a beautiful system for imaging. So I'm gonna show you an example of what we see when we cut. So this is a spindle expressing uh, GFP tubulin to, so we can see where the spindle is and I'm gonna cut kind of on that right edge here, the movie will loop. So that red X is where the cut is. And then you can see that after the cut, that remaining K fiber stub pointed out by the yellow arrow, after a little while, it starts splaying apart. And you can see kind of two um, remaining K fiber stubs. Uh, it, the one stub is splayed into two as it, as it um, is repaired and reattached to the spindle. And what we first notice about this is that we, we see this splaying behavior about half the time, right? So it's, it, that started to suggest to us that there is something that's able to hold the K-fiber um, together, but that it's not so strong that it can't be uh, disrupted, right? So that it seems like whatever um, is holding it together is kind of tuned to other cellular forces. And then the other thing we noticed is that when we do see it splay, the splaying response generally follows this poleward transport response, which I've told you is powered by dynein. So remember I told you that dynein gets recruited to that minus N, pulls the minus N back into, back into the pole to reattach it to the spindle. And we don't see the splaying until after we see that stub start moving back to the pole. So we wondered whether, um, whether that splaying response might be associated with uh, poleward transport. So we examined that in a couple of ways. First, we looked at the timing. So as I said, we found that the, the time of maximal splaying shown in this graph on the left here, I'm sorry, I'm not finding my pointer. So I will just trust that you can look at the left side of the graph. Um, so on the left graph here, when we looked at the time of maximal splaying compared with the time when the stub started moving toward the pole, it was generally almost always followed in time. And then we um, exerted a molecular perturbation to uh, deplete Numa, which is involved in recruiting this poleward transport response. And we found that in that case, we see a reduction in the total amount of splaying. In other words, if the cell is not as good at pulling the minocins back into the, to the spindle pole, we don't see as much splaying, indicating that it is indeed that that splaying force is kind of prying apart the K fiber. And that if you don't have that, it holds together. Okay. Uh, in a some, something like this, that the dynein molecules are, are prying it apart when it does come apart. Okay. Um, so together, this suggested to us that the cross-linking within K-fibers is kind of of similar strength to other spindle forces, which kind of makes sense. We want the K-fiber to be adaptable, to be able to to change um, as it as the um, as the uh, spindle changes shape, but to not be uh, so you know floppy and unstable that it just comes apart altogether. And then we next wanted to see um, what might be the molecular source of this 
response. So we started by um, looking at a, a few different molecular candidates and, and the uh, Kinesin 12 K15 was a, a good uh, candidate for us because it was already um, known to localize prefer preferentially to K fibers. Um, and there are also some new pharmacological inhibitors that target K15 specifically that, that helped us to, um, to target this molecule and see if it was involved. Um, and it, it's a um, side note that, that one of the reasons that K15 is an attractive um, molecular candidate is that it can help cells form bipolar spindles it, when egg 5 is inhibited. So egg 5 inhibitors, some of you may know, have were a very like salient um, cancer target, but but um, those drugs have proved have proven very disappointing in terms of their eff effectiveness. Perhaps partly because um, if Ag5 is inhibited, K15 can kind of take its place. So the hope is that perhaps by um, inhibiting both kinesins together, that might improve the effectiveness of those drugs. All right, so we looked at um, two K15 inhibitors, one of which um, inhibits motor activity, but not microtubule binding. So in that case, um, the, the K15 still binds to the microtubules, but doesn't let go. And the second um, inhibits both motor activity and binding. And so on the left here, I'll show you an example of that second inhibitor, which inhibits both binding and, um, and, uh, and, um, and motor activity, and you can see that we we tended to see more splaying in the K fibers with this drug, even um, in the absence of ablation. And then when we ablate, we find that these um, these K fibers are more likely to splay even without poleward transport. Okay, so we don't see such a big difference with the um, the inhibitor that that um, preserves binding. That's the middle one. Um, K15 and one, but the one that inhibits both microtubule binding and motor activity um, substantially uh, lengthens the, the duration of splay episodes and makes them more likely to occur in the absence of, um, of polar transport. So essentially we think that K15 is at least one of the contributors um, of mechanically holding together the K fiber, um, although it may not be you know, the only thing. We do still see K fibers are sometimes able to, to hold together even with these K K15 inhibition. All right, and so then uh, for the rest of my time today, I'm going to tell you one second brief vignette about what happens uh, with the fission yeast spindle, um, a, a second model organism that we've been using in my lab when we uh, perturb the mechanics of the spindle uh, by laser ablation in that organism. So in contrast to the mammalian spindle, the um, spindle in the fission yeast S. plumbi forms a single microtubule bundle. So it's it's an attractive, it was an attractive organism to us to study because the um, mechanics of this, um, of the spindle are, are in some sense simpler since there's sort of a, a single microtubule bundle. Um, and the other thing that's different about uh, Pombi that's relevant for the rest of this talk is that it undergoes closed mitosis, meaning that there's no nuclear envelope breakdown. So the whole, um, the whole cell division happens inside, uh, the whole chromosome segregation happens inside an intact nucleus, um, which potentially exerts sort of compressive force on the whole spindle as the spindle is elongated. So we wanted to see what happens when we sever microtubule bundles in this spindle um, and, and how, is, how, how, do, how do these additional forces on it affect its mechanics. So this is some work from an undergraduate in my lab, Parsa Zaris Fandabadi. And um, I want to first mention the initial response that we saw, which is that after we cut the spindle, the poles seem to collapse together. And this happens either with short spindles or with long spindles. No matter when we cut, um, the, the two spindle halves seem to collapse together. And this um, had been previously observed um, in the work that I'm citing here, but had not really been per, uh, previously described the, the molecular source of this response in the literature. Although the um, assumption had kind of been from this previous work that essentially pressure on um, the nucleus trying to relax back into a spherical shape was probably what caused this collapse. Um, and I'm going to show you some data that we don't think that's what's going on. And our first hint that maybe that's not what was going on is, is shown in movies like the one on the right here, where you can see that the spindle collapses, but the two poles seem to kind of go around toward each other in a way that doesn't fully make sense from just a sort of mechanical relaxation of the of the um, nucleus as a whole. All right. 
but the the reason we were sort of initially thinking that this was likely to be just a mechanical relaxation is that when we look at the um, pole to pole distance over time, we see an exponential response that's sort of consistent with viscoelastic relaxation, which is what had been you know previously um, qualitatively described before. And so we thought that was a good hypothesis um, at first as well. Um, however, from data that I don't have time to show you today, we found that essentially it, it, it does not appear that either the, the chromosomes within the nucleus or the envelope relaxation are consistent with um, being the driving response of this inward movement of the spindle poles. So then we started to see whether it might be um, an active microtubule motor-based transport. And in fact, um, we see some data that, that suggests that that's the case. So the first um, evidence for that is that when we um, inhibit microtubule dynamics with the drug MBC, we see um, slower collapse over time. So that's the top graph here. And sort of at all concentrations that we've tried of MBC, we still see some collapse of the um, spindle poles toward each other when microtubule dynamics are inhibited. Um, enough, I will say enough to, to not completely d get rid of the spindle, but enough to perturb the dynamics to some extent. If we use too high of drug, then we don't have spindles at all. Um, and so then we started looking at, you know, minus indirected motors that might be responsible for this. And in fact, we do see that, that dynein um, seems to be at least one of the things responsible, although we do still see some um, response, uh, some, some collapse um, in, um, in cells depleted of dynein, suggesting that there may be additional um, additional motors involved um, in addition to dining. All right. And so I think the, the thing that this work underscored for us that we found very interesting is that both the mammalian and the yeast spindles are able to detect and repair mechanical damage resulting from laser ablation. So it sort of suggests to us that this kind of robustness to mechanical perturbation, a perturbation that I'll acknowledge is quite different from ones that cells normally encounter, right? They're not normally going to be, you know, subjected to um, being cut with a laser, but yet they're still able to be robust to this kind of perturbation, perhaps because they've been evolved to just be robust to mechanical perturbation in general, right? To be able to adapt um, to changes in force from inside and outside the cell. Uh, and so we observe that, you know, in two organisms that are quite widely separated by evolution, right? In both the mammalian and the yeast spindles, all right? So I will stop there today and um, acknowledge the folks in my group who contributed to this work. So the folks in uh, bold on the left here are the, the students uh, whose work I told you about today. Um, the K15 inhibitor work was also done in collaboration with Puck Ohi at um, the University of Michigan, who's been developing some of those inhibitors. Um, and uh, thanks very much for your, for your time and attention today and, and looking forward to hearing questions. So thanks, Mary, for a really nice talk. And uh, there's quite a few questions, and hopefully they'll keep coming. And so the um, uh, maybe Robert Young asks if the K fiber spindling and fibril recruitment um, could they be piezo piezoelectric or some sort of stress dependent interactions between neighbors? Ah, so like, is there a mechanical, is there mechanic, mechanical detect, is like, the, is the cell using mechanics to detect the, detect it's more, if, if the, my apologies for talking, um, it's more of, if you have two spindles next to each other, and there's some sort of pull in response, could there be recruitment between the two, because they both feel a response, and therefore there's like a shearing interaction, so that once there's a laser cut, they spindle out, because there's no longer that shearing or stressing interaction, that's what I was meaning, and I apologize. Oh, no, thanks. That's a, that is a cool idea. So in the K fiber that splays apart, you're saying, is there sort of shear force that might be keeping the K fibers together before and that that gets disrupted when we cut? Um, that's, that's a cool idea. I'm trying to think how we would look at that. I mean, one thing that um, this work is, is work from, um, Sophie Dumont's lab and maybe others. I mean, there, there has been some some work looking at kind of um, turnover in in the um, K fiber, like from FRAP um, in response to laser relation and elsewise. I mean, and you do see that there seems to be some sliding of the microtubules relative to each other, suggesting that there might be shear force like that. Um, I'd have to think a little bit more about how the cell would detect that, but that's definitely a cool idea. Thanks. <laughs> 
So uh, the next question, thanks for the answer. Uh, the, the next question is uh, just simple from Wiley. He asks if it's possible to uh, visualize the motors and the microtubules simultaneously in the ablation experiment. Yeah, so that is something that we've done a bit. So with it, with Sophie's and what I was in Sophie's lab, the the data I didn't show about um, recruiting of dynine to the minus ends um, after ablation, that was done with two color two color um, experiments like the ones you're describing. So I don't have those mo those movies up today, but essentially what we see is that like after we cut, we can see the microtubules and then we can see a puncta of um, of dynein and some binding partners of dynein get recruited to that spot after ablation. Um, for technical reasons, two color experiments with the laser ablation are a little bit of a pain. Um, it's it's a challenge to find wavelengths that with which we can ablate that don't completely bleach our second our second um, fluor fluorophore. So um, so so it's it's not easy to do those two color experiments, but it is possible and. And uh, and we're looking at sort of trying similar two color things in the yeast system to see you know whether whether things get recruited or to, to the ablation spots or whether there's you know motors all all along the microtubules before and so on. Uh, so uh, Danielle uh, Sim Simoni, sorry, uh, asked if you know the if the likelihood of the stump display is related to the motor density along the stump. Yeah, um, that's a good question. So you're asking Daniela if like K15 concentration affects how likely it is to splay? Yes, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, we have not done that experiment yet. So we depleting K15 in our system is not super easy. So that's partly why we've used these inhibitors instead of um, instead of depleting, depleting K15. So we have not looked at effects of um, density, but that that is for sure an interesting idea to follow up. I mean, I, we've thought about you know trying the, the doing those experiments would would probably be easier if we would switch to a system other than PTK. Although PTK has some advantages in terms of being able to target the ablation likely uh, nicely. So so anyway, we're not we're not sure, but that's a that's a great question. Okay, and maybe the last question of this, uh, you know, before we switch gears to the informal um, discussion, uh, Jing Chen asks, what would happen if you laser ablate all the K fibers in the spindle in open mitosis? Does the spindle collapse inward? Yeah, it's super cool. So if you cut across the whole spindle, it, there's so much inward directed force that you can pull the whole pole inward. So generally, if you cut just a single K fiber, that K fiber gets, it gets repaired back to that pole and sort of pulled toward the pole. But if you cut across the whole K fiber, then you recruit so much dynein that um, all of those, all of the dynein motors together are strong enough to pull the whole pole inward instead of pulling the you know half spindle um, toward the middle. And I've often wanted to kind of like cut both sides and see what you know how how does that competition happen? But that's those experiments we haven't gotten to yet. But um, Thanks. And I just saw the question come up. Have we tried ablation with the cells in our confinement? No, we haven't done that in my lab. I think Sophie's lab has tried that a, li a little bit, but I'm not, I don't really know what the results are of those, but, but yeah, I'm squishing the cells, but, but I haven't done that in my group. Okay. Uh, 